Well, high five the person on your left, high five the person on your right, and then grab a seat. Who'd you high five first? That's probably the person you like the most, hey? We got some offended people, the second high five ease. Like, hey man, I thought you loved me. Um, well, today we have a very special treat. We do something uh, like once a year, we're probably gonna start doing it twice a year, called Five for Five. So, if you've never been here for a Five for Five, get ready to clap, get ready to cheer, get ready to celebrate, get ready to take notes, get ready to follow along in your Bible, get ready to lean in, get ready to hear from God. We have five people who are each gonna share for five minutes, and in that five minutes, they have packed in a 30-minute word into just five minutes. So it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose today, but it is going to be good. And so in a moment, uh, you'll see our first speaker come up. But we got Bob, we got Shannon, we got Jay, we got Patrick, we got Aaron, all bringing a message today. Now we're putting the heat on them this time because as they speak on the screens, there is going to be a five-minute countdown. And so they are quite literally racing against the clock. We're going to have fun with it. They're going to share what God has been doing in their life as they share what God has put in their heart. So what we want to do is, like I said, we want to make sure that we're cheering them on, that we're engaging them, that we're supporting. It's so awful when you preach and it's crickets out here. So we want to be the opposite of that. We want to, amen, wow, that's good, come on, say that, right, that's good. Whatever you got to do to shout them down, do it. And as each one of them, we can throw up a hand, st stand up if they're really killing it. Yeah, I wasn't though, I wasn't though. <laughs> um, so as each one finishes, as each one begins, we want to make sure that we clap and we just celebrate and honor what God has uh, done through them and what God has put in their hearts to share. So would you welcome our very first speaker, give a loud round of applause for Mr. Bob Allen. Let's go. Get ready, get ready. God is in the house. God is going to do something in your life today. Today, let's jump right into the scriptures. Just so you know, I'm Bob Allen. I'm on team here. Just in case you didn't know who I was, I forgot to introduce myself, but I understand my name's on the screen, so it doesn't really matter. Let's turn to Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, if we could get a revelation what this is all about, we'd be waving bye-bye boring Christianity in the rearview mirror. Now, what's the, what's the need for overcoming? Well, if you overcome something, you've been in a fight. Yeah. Yeah. Now, see, Jesus tells us in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. He also tells us in John 5, 544, sorry, 844, the devil is the father of lies. He's full of deceit. 1 Peter 5 eight tells us, your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion prowling around, seeing whom he may devour. See, Jesus warned us. The enemy's trying to steal your joy. He's trying to steal your peace. He's trying to steal your marriage. He's trying to steal your family. We need to fight. He's trying to make us compromise our Christianity. He's trying to make us walk away from our faith. He's trying to tell us the Bible is not relevant in 2024. But the Bible is true. It's alive. We need to fight. Yeah. Now, what's this blood of the Lamb? Well, take, go with me down to the banks of the Jordan River. John the Baptist is baptizing people. And out, of the, out of the crowd comes Jesus. What does John, John the Baptist say in John 1.29? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, he knew. He had a revelation of what Jesus was going to do. He knew Jesus was going to go on the cross. He knew he's going, to be, he's going to have stripes on his back for your healing. He knew he was going to bleed a brutal death. He knew the blood was going to spill. But see, what happened was when Jesus said it is finished, it wasn't the end of it. That's the beginning of it. Because Jesus, through this death, redeemed mankind back to God. That blood that was spilled, 
It didn't just cover the sin that a sacrificial lamb used to do. Jesus' blood destroyed sin. It washed it away. It annihilated it. It, it blew it away as far as from the east as from the west. That is what the blood does. Oh, man, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, if you can't tell. <laughs> and we used to sing a song, the blood will never lose its power. Yeah. No, never. Yeah. Jesus' blood atones for sin forever. Yeah. It will never lose its power. Yeah. Oh, we got to start believing this. Yeah. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. Take some notes because I'm just going to give you some highlights. It says God made us alive through Jesus' death. It says we are forgiven of all of our sins. Our, our debt has been canceled. It's been paid in full. Jesus nailed it all to the cross. Through Jesus, we can triumph. Oh, people, that is why Jesus said in the second part of John 10, 10, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Grab it, people. The third part of that verse says, they overcame by the word of their testimony. Right. Now, a testimony means you've gone through something. It means you've gone through a test. It means you've won. I'm going to tell you one of my many testimonies. I have lots in my life. I'm going to share this one. About 10 years ago, I was getting ready to come home from Regina. And I was uh, getting in my car. And I prayed that God would give me clarity of mind, keep me alert. And I asked for the warring angels to be around my car. I understood the power of prayer. As I was driving into Verdon, I was coming around that corner. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a car coming from the north, coming across the highway. This person was supposed to stop, but they didn't want to. They were accelerating. In that moment, I went, Jesus, I do not die today. And I would normally put my foot on the brake. But no, in my spirit, I had the word accelerate. I gunned it. Now, that didn't stop the crash. There was a crash. There was a lot of metal that got all banged up. There was a windshield got smashed. The airbags went off. My car twirled around five or six times. But you know what? That car hit me behind, behind the driver's seat, right behind the driver's seat. The paramedic said, man, we don't know how you are alive. The back part of that car is gone. But see, God protected me. God had a purpose. Because of that, I get to see more of my daughter-in-laws coming to my family. I get to see my grandkids. I get to meet all you people. Guys, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What's your testimony today? Your testimony is you are forgiven. You are more than a conqueror. Come on, come on somebody. What did God do in your life? You are forgiven, you are redeemed. You are a new creation through Jesus Christ and you are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Bob, for kicking us off. My name is Shannon. Um, a little, a couple quick things. I want to thank our pastors for asking me to share today. Um, I am new to Rose officially since June of this year when I moved here from the States. Um, I'm newly married to our next-gen pastor, David, and I get to serve in Rose Youth and Rose Kids. And this is so important to me because when I was nine or ten, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that changed me forever. And I can remember that day, there really wasn't that much happening in my life at that time. It was a normal Sunday, but that day my kid's pastor was preaching to us kids about what it meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at this point, I'd said yes to Jesus, but I knew that I wanted more of him. I knew there was something more for me. And so I I look back and I remember standing in this room, this very boring cement floor, and just asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the only way I can describe it is that in that moment, I was filled with a boldness and a confidence that couldn't come from me on my own at age nine. I was, I was changed. I had a new identity as a child of God. And from this moment on, I really didn't think too much of that encounter, um, but I knew, 
I knew that there was more. And so I want to take a second and go to um, Ezekiel chapter 34. Excuse me, yeah, chapter 34, verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and find them. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel. And further down, they will lie down in pleasant places and feed in the lush pastures of the hills. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost ones who strayed away, and I will bring them safely home again. I'll bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. We can see in this passage that good shepherds go after their lost sheep, and good shepherds strengthen the injured ones, and they tend to their sheep, making a home for them. And the sheep let their shepherd guide him. We see this analogy all over scripture that we are sheep and God is our shepherd. He is pursuing us. He is going after us. And that morning, 15 years ago, I really didn't think that much of that encounter. But now I can see looking back and in light of this passage that I had been marked and I had been changed And now I can look back and see in middle school when I walked through a really hard mental illness, I was still full of my identity in Christ because I remembered that first encounter. Like a a shepherd tending to his herding sheep, I knew that God would remain with me. And then later, as I graduated high school and I was trying to figure out what to do next, I lifted my hands in surrender and said, I will go where you want me to go. Because I remembered that first encounter and I remembered that the shepherd always leads his sheep home. I can look back and see when I finished college and I felt the Lord leading me into something new. I I remembered that first encounter and I moved across the country full of faith. Because I knew that he was always searching for his scattered sheep. And again, this year when he brought me to a new country and a new community, I remember that faith-building moment. And I remember how after that, no one could ever tell me that my God wasn't pursuing me, that my God wasn't seeking after me. And now I look back at that moment 15 years ago and I stand in awe because he used that moment as a child to be the catalyst for everything that would come after. And just like he was searching after me then, he's searching after you today. Every hour, every day, he's a good shepherd. Every time I've laid my life down in search of him, he's met me because he's always been pursuing us. Every time, like a shepherd in search of his sheep. And wherever you find yourself in your relationship with him today, He wants to meet you again and again. All it takes is one encounter to change everything. All it takes is one step. Will you take a step towards him? What's up, everyone? I am Jay. And the testimony I want to share with you guys today is rooted in a very simple idea, um, which I think is important because the simpler we can make understanding the Bible, the more we can apply it to our lives, and the more we can actually see biblical change in our lives. So many of you may not know this about me, but I didn't grow up in a believing household. I grew up atheist, and um, that's kind of what society gave me. So with that... I was led down some pretty dark avenues early on in my life. Um, I started drinking pretty heavily when I was 13 years old, and I soon shifted to smoking pot daily for the majority of my teenage formative years. Now, those two things coming together kind of transformed me into this, like, mumbling, drooling, permafried stoner thing. (laughs) And... (laughs) Fast forward a few years after going through a really harsh breakup, um, by the grace of God, a coworker of mine actually invited me out to church. And I said yes. I was questioning things, so I said yes. And after a couple weeks of going, I gave my life to Christ. And um, yeah, that's amazing. Praise him for that, for sure. But that left me in a weird spot because I had to cut ties with my old friends. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I had the thought of being the one to bring Jesus to them. But I was in no way, like, mature enough in my Christianity or let alone cognitive enough to be the one to do that. So I burnt the bridges. And besides, what's me as a new creation doing in my old environment? Like, that's not where I belong. So this put me in a weird cocktail of a situation. I was a new believer. I was a mumbling, drooling, permafried stoner. And I had no friends. <laughs> So this meant going to, like, church services, going to church social events, going to just serve myself. It gave me anxiety because I wanted to have friends, right? So I knew going into those situations that there would be friendships that have been established over lifetimes. There would be cliques and groups that are so concrete, it's going to be difficult for me to actually get into them. And that led me to pray a very simple prayer. Rooted in the very first verse I ever memorized. It's a classic verse. It's Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So this prayer that I would pray is, God, thank you for making me a great communicator. That was it. Now, it might not seem like it on the surface, but that prayer was indeed rooted in Proverbs 3, 5. Because my understanding of myself was mumbling, drooling, permafried stoner. I couldn't lean on that anymore. I had to trust in the Lord going into those situations. So I said, okay, God, you know what? You call me an overcomer. You say I am more than a conqueror. You know the hairs on my head, so you've designed me. So I'm picking up the Lord, and we're going into these situations. And I can tell you guys, through that prayer, I met my core friend group, who I've known now for 13 years. I, I met my wife. <laughs> Like, like, honestly, like my kids, they may not be around here. Whitaker, Sterling, Amare, who knows if I didn't pray that prayer and pick up the Lord, who knows what would have actually happened. So I don't know if you guys caught it, but I did four very simple things, okay? After becoming a Christian, I surrendered the situation to God. I read my Bible. I prayed biblical prayers, and I showed up. If you're missing one of those four things in your life, it's going to be very difficult to see biblical change actually happen in your life, right? Pick up your cross daily. Read your Bible. One of Christ's titles is the Word of God. When you read your Bible, you get to know Jesus. Pray without ceasing. That means whether it's big or small, pray about it. God's going to care about it because he cares about you. And finally, show up. Jesus had to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew his betrayer was there. He knew what the difficulties were facing him. But more so, he knew the glory that was on the other side of it. What glory are we missing out on? Because we're not doing those four simple things. Right? Surrender, Bible, pray, show up. Thanks, everyone. Hey, everybody, let's hear it for Jay. So, hey, I'm, I'm Patrick Cairns. So, I'm a child of God. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, and I'm an entrepreneur. So, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, my grandparents were pastors. My mother was a choir director. My dad was a deacon. So basically spent my entire life in the church. From time to time, I drifted, of course, as we all do, and, and I worked my way back. As it says in um, Proverbs 22, 6, it says, um, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. I ain't old. I'm just <laughs> so I'm going to entitle this, Just Ask. So this summer, my wife and I were blessed to go to Churchill, amazing part of the world. We saw belugas, we saw polar bears, but guess what? Northern Manitoba, we didn't see any northern lights. There was there. The weather didn't cooperate. So we got back, and we took this American couple, and we went to the outskirts of Winnipeg uh, in the dark, uh, Pine Ridge Hollow, and he, uh, the American set up his expensive uh, camera facing north, and, um, and we waited. Um, 1220, 1225. And so I back up from the group, and I say a little prayer. Well, actually, I whine. 
And I say, Lord, come on, 62 years old, 48 years in this country, I've never seen the Northern Lights. I said, can you just show me your glory once, have my eyes closed, and I hear Rhonda go, something's happening. And to the north, boom, there's the Northern Lights. So I, of course I weep, but, uh, so that's a small thing. You know, asking a small thing. But we can ask big, right? So it reminded me of my favorite verse, which is Ephesians 3.20. Now, like right now, to him, to God, who is able to do more than we can ask, think, or imagine, right? So ask big. So my previous relationship was 29 years. And when that ended, I was alone for about two years. And then I prayed. I said, Lord, you know, I really don't want to go on my own. And so my son was, was wanting a job that he didn't qualify for. He was only in it for four months. So he said to me, Dad, why don't we pray and fast? And just like we did this summer with the church and saw amazing things happen, we prayed and we fasted one meal a day, just one meal a day. And within two weeks, he got the job, and God sent me my angel. So I'm going to tell you about that. So don't, on, don't only ask. Ask big. Because I, uh, Ron and I were, were um, volunteering at a charity. And um, we had this event. And, and I had a heart attack, literally. And then um, uh, in the recovery, I, I, I was a, an instructor at Nine Rounds Kickboxing Gym. So anyway, so we go to the event. And I showed up late because I had to work. And there's one chair available, and it's next to Rhonda. And so we spend the whole night talking. I invited her to come to nine rounds, you know. I got no game, but I invited her, anyway. <laughs> so she comes, and she works out, and we had a great time. And then I, I asked her, what are you doing the rest of the day? So this is Thursday, the event. This is Saturday. And she said, she gives me an itinerary, and, and I say, uh, and she asked me, what are you doing? So I said, well, I'm, I'm going to listen to jazz at the Forks. Would you like to come? So she says, sure. So then we go and have a great time. And we didn't have each other's phone numbers. And so I sent an email. And, it, <laughs> and I say, um, you know, I had a great time. Would you like to do it again sometime? Is, uh, is tomorrow too soon? And she says, well, I'm going to church tomorrow morning, and you can come with me. So I went, check. <laughs> so then um, I say to her, yeah, um, like, by four days, we know. And we married um, a year later on my, what would have been my dad's 100th birthday. And I say to Rhonda, you know, um, there's, I made a list of 10 things that I wanted and 30 things that I didn't want. And God gave me nine out of the 10 things. So if you know Rhonda, 90% is not enough. So she said, what, what did I miss? So I said, well, uh, I thought I'd be going back and forth to South Africa and I'd be marrying a woman of color. So she says, well, Manila is a color. It's, <laughs> it's in the Crayola box. But, Anyway, so I'm, asking, I'm telling you to ask big because God will give you, because not only did he give me uh, um, an angel, he gave me uh, the top cardiac nurse in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the entire city. When you have a heart attack and you get that, you know there's a God. So I'm telling you, ask, and he will give you more than you can ask, think, or imagine. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If we haven't met, my name is Aaron. Um, I'm originally from uh, Melbourne, Australia, and I've called Canada home since about grade 12. Um, and the story of my testimony is, like many of you, it's still being written. And the word I want to leave you with today is push. The story of the prodigal son says he came to his senses, and the father ran to him. Push. He pulled himself together and pushed himself towards his father's house. Faith, having it, believing in it, it needs action. James 2 verse 17 says, Faith, if it doesn't have works to back it up, it is by itself dead, inoperative and ineffective. Push. A couple years ago, when I recommitted my heart to Jesus, I actually I prayed for godly friends. And friends who wouldn't lead me or encourage me down a path of destruction, but instead, friends of a feather, and friends who would challenge my thinking and be the iron that sharpens my iron. 
And when I do an inventory check of my life, and even when I look around this room, that prayer has been answered. What friends do you have or do you need to pray for that you maybe need to push away from? Push. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a story of a business owner who entrusts his possessions, bags of gold, cold talents, with three of his employees before leaving on a business trip, dividing it in proportion to their abilities, of course. When the boss came back, two of the three doubled what was given to them, but the third guy, afraid of making a mistake, messing up, or potentially losing what was given to him, he hid it. He buried it. He did nothing with it. When the business owner, the boss, asked for his possessions back, he saw that the guy with five turned it into ten, the guy with two into four, but the guy with one, nothing. He did nothing with it. The boss got mad. You did nothing with it? The boss took the one talent or the bag of gold and gave it to the one with plenty. Jesus used that story and said in verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and have abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. So the question is, what talents have you been given to not just maintain, but to use, multiply, to increase? Your story is still being written. So push. One of my early visits to Rose Church, Pastor Mark preached on a passage that I've actually never heard before, and he did it recently. He referenced it recently. It was a story of the king and the prophet Elisha. Elisha instructed the king to shoot arrows out of the tower window and strike the ground. The king only shot three arrows. And as it turned out, the king's army, God's people, only won three battles. So that's what I was going to do. That's what I thought at the time when I heard this message. I'm going to strike the ground. I'm going to keep shooting my arrows. How many arrows are you willing to shoot that you're going to push through? Each week you see me serving on team. That's my arrow. Um, and if I can, I will. God gave me the gift to sing, so I want to give it back. Uh, God gave me the, the, the talent to connect with people, so I want to give it back. Because right. to be honest, there have been days um, I didn't want to serve, you know, um, but I did anyways. Um, and days I didn't want to, I didn't feel like going to church, but I went anyways. My story is still being written. Push. One of my favorite lyrics in a song, which we did today, walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you've never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, but knowing the battle's won, for you've never failed me yet. Push. The toxic relationships that I felt obligated to keep are no longer around. The bad habits, which were once just normal, no longer have a grip on me. And I'm talking addictions to substances are gone. No longer do I suffer from hangovers due to using tomorrow's energy today and feeling so numb to my emotions that even when I want to scream, no sound comes out of my mouth. No longer am I trapped in a headspace or realm of despair, wishing I just want to feel normal. But nothing changes if nothing changes. So what toxic or bad habits that you need to push away from? Exodus 17, 8 to 16. In the story of God's people going into battle, and when Moses held up his staff and his arms, God's people began to win. But the moment he lowered, the army gained the advantage. When he lowered them due to being tired, he had to push through the pain and keep his arms up. Fast forward 2,000 years later, the ultimate intercessor of our faith, held his arms up, and uh, won the battle for his people. Amen? That's it. Push.